Good afternoon. On behalf of the NYU Law Venture Fund, I want to welcome you all to our conversation with Brandon Nelson. Uh, we're really thrilled to have Brandon and we'll get started with that in a few minutes. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I just wanted to welcome all of you. My name is Anthony Thomas. I am the Executive Director of Development and Strategic Partnerships at NYU Law, and I lead the NYU Law Venture Fund. Um, wanted to tell you just a bit about the fund before we begin today. Uh, the fund's mission is to empower our students and their alumni by uniting, educating, and supporting promising entrepreneurs and their startups. And we do that in a few different ways. Uh, for students, we offer summer internships to students after their 1L year, and we offer summer grants uh, to students after their 1L and 2L year. And for students and alumni, we make investments into companies that have been founded by NYU Law graduates who are raising seed stage capital. With that, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, wanna just welcome Brandon to our conversation today. Uh, as you all may know, Brandon Nelson is the general counsel at JetBlue. He's a graduate of the class of 1999 and Brandon, we're really thrilled uh, to have you with us. Uh, so Brandon, we'll kick things off. And if you don't mind uh, unmuting yourself, I'd, I'd love to uh, obviously start off and hear a bit about your time at law school. But before we do that, Brandon, just want to let everyone know that we certainly want this to be a conversation. So if um, you're on your computers or phones, uh, depending on what device you're using, there is a Q&A function. Um, you, if you're on your computer, you should find that at the bottom of your screen. So please do send in any questions you have and we'd be happy to add them to a conversation as we go through with that. Um, having said that, Brandon, let's get started. So uh, welcome, thrilled to have you. Uh, Brandon, I didn't read your bio intentionally because we'd, we'd love to, uh, to have a brief conversation about your background. So uh, tell us a bit more about yourself, Brandon, and maybe looking back as well, we'd love to hear about why you decided to attend NYU Law. Sure, uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, very exciting to be here. Uh, you're clearly dating me. You mentioned 99, which sounds like forever ago. So I'm, here, I'm sure half of our audience is sort of horrified and uh, wondering why they're here with this old guy. So uh, yeah, NYU, um, what a great place to go to law school. Uh, when you think about uh, where it's located, that was certainly an attraction. I mean, it's right in the heart of the village. Uh, you mentioned 99, uh, so I think of Dean Sexton, who many of you uh, probably know or know of, and um, he just had an incredible vision. He had a vision to build a global law school, and that concept at the time was somewhat unique, so that was very attractive. So I was very much attracted to the global law school. Dean Sexton, uh, personally, his vision, his leadership, uh, and, you know, the location. And also NYU has a long tradition of being a part of the community uh, and being very community oriented and service oriented. And although I didn't end up in sort of public interest law, that commitment um, remains something uh, that's important to me now and it was important to me then. So uh, you also look at it among its peer sets. Uh, it's sort of collaborative nature. Uh, it doesn't have that sort of uh, connotation of being uh, cutthroat and sort of individualistic. You know, the the one L book was out around the time that I started law school, uh, and so the horror stories of people tearing pages out of books and all that sort of stuff. Uh, none of that, in my experience, existed at NYU. So um, those are just a few of the reasons. But I could talk about NYU forever because I love the institution. That's awesome, Brandon. Um Curious to hear coming into law school and while you were a student, what were your thoughts about your professional career? And also what did you do uh, during your summers at law school? Sure, so thoughts about my professional career were very few um, other than at some point I'm gonna have to get a job. Um, so I didn't know, I say that to mean, I didn't really know, you know, you open this with when, uh, or when you and I were talking privately, do you go to law school thinking that you're going to be a general counsel mm -hmm. of an airline? The answer is no. Um, so I didn't really have a well thought out plan. What, what I did know uh, is I really enjoy the training and the experience of law school because it really opens up your mind 
uh, you really learn how to think in a structured way, ask the right questions, um, perform an analysis based on the facts that are in front of you. So all of those skills, uh, I did have uh, an inclination that it would lead to something, a meaningful career, exactly what I didn't know. Uh, a few observations, I know I liked sort of business law broadly, transactional, um, if you will, uh, more so than litigation. You read about some of these cases in law school and they start in you know, 1960 and they end in 1973. And I'm like, that sounds uh, <laughs> horrific to be on the same thing for a decade. So I like the pace of sort of doing deals and transactions. So I knew I kind of liked that. I was a business major at Howard University. So I kind of had that slant uh, going in. Um, in terms of my summer, so my first so knowing that eventually I would probably end up in some sort of corporate or business type law, uh, I really did want to do something that was meaningful, impactful. So my first summer, I worked uh, in Southern California in Los Angeles in South Central uh, Los Angeles at an organization called the Legal Corps of Los Angeles, which was a uh, sort of quasi legal aid that was privately funded that focused on, had a specific focus on public housing residents and protecting their rights. And that was one of the best experiences I, I've ever had in my legal career. So that was summer one, summer two, then I um, quickly jumped ship and went to the dark side and worked at a law firm. Um, so I worked at Sherman and Sterling and for those of us old enough to remember, probably very few of us, it was the summer that there was a big uh, incident. They take, you know, they take the summers out and they wine you and dine you and you go on all these great trips uh, and dinners. And there was one particular dinner where a bunch of the summers got sick off of some seafood at a very prominent uh, Manhattan restaurant. And uh, it actually made the Today Show. So it was a slow news cycle. So you have wow. all you know, this fancy law firm wanting, dining all these summers, and they go to this fancy restaurant and they get sick. Thankfully, I was not there because I spent half my summer in Singapore, which was um, part of the reason I really wanted to go to Sherman. So I split my summer between New York and Singapore uh, and an incredible experience. That's amazing. And did you start at Sherman right after? And then I joined Sherman in the fall of 99. Uh, the market was bustling. I joined in the mergers and acquisitions group. Uh, you know, a lot of deal volume. They were doing the big um, sort of interesting deals, the Viacom, CBS, you know, iteration one, we're up to sort of two or three now. Um, so that was very much an attraction, sort of doing these big marquee high profile um, transactions. So it was a great time and, uh, and a great experience there. That's awesome. So I want to talk a bit about the GC role before we talk more about JetBlue specifically. And some of my questions about JetBlue will be around JetBlue, the startup, uh, and thinking about culture there and so many, so many angles that we can go there, Brandon, and certainly want to talk about uh, JetBlue's tech ventures that, um, that you're very involved with. You sit on the investment committee there. But before we go down that path, I'm curious to hear uh, you're a chairman, uh, you're working in the areas that you're interested in. Um, what leads you to JetBlue? Talk to us about how you get to uh, that role. Uh, and then certainly want to talk a bit more about uh, the role of general counsel. Sure. A uh, long and not obvious path <laughs> to getting here. So as I mentioned, it was 99 when I started. The market was great. Um, you know, people, jobs were plenty. Uh, there were a lot of transactions. It was sort of the glory days. And then 9-11 hits. And uh, I recall very specifically where I was the night before we had actually just closed on a deal or we actually had signed, not closed, but we had signing. So it was a Monday night, went out to dinner, I was very excited. Uh, then Tuesday morning, we all know what happens. And as a result, the market completely slows down. Uh, business sort of grinds to a halt and a lot of law firms are making tough decisions and having downsizes. And as a result, I was laid off the following year. So 2002 or in the 2003, I think it was, um, but directly resulting from 9-11. Uh, and, I, and I tell that story um, because it, it really brought my sort of thinking in terms of my career into a, a, to a sharper focus. Um, so I pounded the pavement in New York for about a year. 
uh, could not land a job, did all sorts of cold calls, worked the network, but the sort of market for transactional lawyers at that time was pretty thin. Um, so fortunately, I grew up in Southern California. Um, I actually moved back home to my childhood bedroom with my parents, uh, which turned out to be a great experience um, living with them as an adult. Uh, I took the California bar and pounded the pavement there, worked my network and ended up at a boutique commercial litigation firm, um, which is fascinating, had no interest, as I mentioned earlier, in litigating, but I'm, I'm glad I did in hindsight, just to have a, a taste of it. Uh, ended up second chairing an eminent domain trial in Santa Maria, um, California, which is just north of Santa Barbara. And some may recall it was actually the court, the courthouse that uh, Michael Jackson had one of his very uh, famous trials in, and it was right around the time that we were in trial. There wasn't didn't exactly overlap, but the court, uh, the courthouse was sort of famous for that. So it was a month long trial, second chaired at eminent domain. We ended up getting a pretty large uh, award for our client. Um, so that was it was fascinating. Wouldn't regret the experience, um, but it also sort of confirmed my instinct that I didn't really want to litigate um, as a career. Uh, and so I came to this point where I then threw out a shingle, I opened up my own sort of sole practice, focusing on small transactional matters, um, which again was great from a growth perspective. You develop a lot of skills, uh, bill collecting among them, <laughs> um, which I didn't love. So I- But a very I, important skill. We need to get paid, right? <laughs> you gotta get paid. <laughs> It, you, you have to get paid and you also have to understand your worth and your value. It's very, when you throw out a shingle, it's very tempting to sort of throw, you know, set up a discount model or, or, or charge a lot less just to generate business. But you understand um, you really can't devalue your yourself or your service. And so that's, that's really a lesson that you learn and that carries on throughout your career. Um, but it, it did lead me to believe that I wanted to collect a regular paycheck. So JetBlue, to your question. So then I focused on very uh, purposefully, I think what many people, you know, use in intentionality now, you know, I was very intentional about this. I didn't use that language, but that certainly was the result and focused on two or three companies I was very interested in that I had a passion for, a passion for. So aviation, airports, airplanes. JetBlue is a startup, as you mentioned. So I started that search in 2004 uh, and ultimately ended up here in 2005. So what did I do specifically? I went on their website um, very frequently, at least once a week. Uh, I talked to anyone that I knew who may be remotely connected. And eventually they posted a job online for a real estate lawyer, uh, which I was not. I applied nonetheless ended up meeting the team. It was a very small team at the time. I was the fourth lawyer hired um, and they really liked me. I enjoyed them and they said, hey, even though you're sort of a general transactional person, we'll bring you in. Um, so that's how I ended up here. Brennan, that's amazing. And I mean, it's incredible for a variety of reasons, including just the story of how you went and had to navigate a series of challenges, had to move home, Certainly, I'm sure, as you said, you were happy to be with family, but there are also challenges associated with that. In, in some ways, um, some common threads to what many are facing in this current environment, right? Uh, so inspiring and encouraging to hear how you navigated all of that. So you join JetBlue in 05, and mm -hmm. then a few years later get named the GC. Uh, curious to hear about your experiences there and uh, the skill sets that you developed that you think led to you moving into that role. Sure. So you're being far too kind a few years later. Um, so, so I started in 2005, as I mentioned, a general transactional lawyer. So what did that mean? I'm, that means that I was handed a stack of agreements and said, can you review these and advise us on any legal issues you see? And that stack included everything from um, de-icing agreements at airports to uh, hosted services agreements, as they were called at the time for our IT backbone and infrastructure to agreements to purchase engines and aircraft. Um, so really ran the gamut of the business. And what it really allowed, it gave me an opportunity to learn 
the business from the inside out and to really meet with all these people who were, uh, you know, our clients internally who are running point on all these deals and to learn the business. And I think that's important because one of the skills that you need as a, uh, as a general counsel uh, and really an in-house lawyer generally is to understand and know the business. Therefore, when you're giving your guidance and counsel, your risk assessment, it's informed. It's informed from a perspective of knowing where the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, uh, vulnerabilities of the business are, and then you can sort of uh, gauge your legal advice accordingly. So I started as a just sort of doing a little bit of everything, uh, but then uh, ultimately started building up a small transactional team here. And then I focused more on uh, the larger transaction. So 2008, uh, Lufthansa came in and bought a 19.9% stake in the company. So that was one of the transactions I worked on. And that was really to provide us liquidity at a different sort of crisis uh, in the industry, time of crisis. So uh, worked on that, went on to become a trustee on our 401k, uh, advised the leadership team on various commercial matters, partnerships with Barclays, American Express, um, but really sort of focusing on larger corporate uh, transactions. Great. And then fast forward to today, can you tell us a little bit about what it means to be GC in the current environment as we face the pandemic, uh, injustice in our country, so many other challenges around the world? Um, what's coming across your desk? What areas are you paying a lot of attention to? Sure. So uh, you you rightfully mentioned this dynamic time in which we're living. Um, uh, so what comes across my desk? You know, I before answering that, maybe I'll just give you a perspective of how I view the general counsel role. And I think most of my peers probably do. Um, I kind of put it into sort of three broad areas of responsibility. The first is leading the team. And the team in this instance, and I think with most general counsels, so it's not just the group of lawyers and legal professionals, uh, it's also our ethics and compliance team, it's our cybersecurity team and our ESG team. So you think about leading across uh, that, that team. You're also a part of what we call our senior leadership team or our CEO team. So one of the direct reports to the CEO. So you sit, and participate in that group that's charged more broadly with carrying out the strategy of the company. And think of that group as, you know, certainly it's the CEO and it's, you know, her, his vision. Uh, in our case, it's Robin, uh, it's his vision, but he really relies upon uh, his direct reports to help shape and inform his vision. So you sit as part of that team and you happen to be a lawyer. So I'm on that team. I happen to be a lawyer. There's our chief people officer who's on that team, he happens to be an HR person and sort of down the line. So participating in that group and that's embracing the company culture that you mentioned earlier. It's understanding and knowing the business. It's being visible out with the front line. It's being a, a leader in all, uh, in every sense of the word. Uh, and then the third bucket is uh, the board. As corporate secretary, you are charged with running the board meetings, oftentimes establishing or influencing the agenda. And essentially the way I think about that role is being the liaison between the leadership team and the board. Certainly the CEO is kind of the first uh, person in that line. And I think the second is, is the general counsel and thinking about when do you escalate things to the board? Um, what sort of things do they wanna be aware of from the leadership team? And what sort of things should we focus on as a leadership team that I know the board's thinking about? So those are kind of the three broad areas of responsibility. Now, what has come across my desk in uh, sort of each of those realms? Think about the things that we're focused on as a business. First is liquidity, which uh, most every business is in this time, certainly in our industry. Um, so, that, so that's one. So a lot of financing deals and transactions um, starting notably with the CARES Act uh, back in March. So a government uh, grant and loan program. So you think about how do you 
uh, apply for that? How do you uh, incorporate it into your overall capitalization structure? Where are the ongoing reporting and compliance requirements? All things that we think about. And, and I should say, it's not certainly just me, it's a team, uh, a team of us, uh, mostly the, the team who has, has done a lot of that work. Um, so you think about liquidity, you think about restoring the public's confidence in flying. So a lot of safety measures. Um, what is, you know, what are the risks in, in flying? What are the risks in being in an airport, just traveling more broadly? You see a lot of these state quarantine uh, issues, certainly here in New York. Um, if you can recall in the Wayback Machine and sort of April and May, it was Florida actually had the quarantine, so we couldn't go down there. Now there's now we're saying they can't come here. Um, so wading through that, and again, it's really our entire team that's doing that, but making sure that we have uh, an important seat at the table and visibility. Uh, and then the last thing that we're sort of thinking about is is cash is cash burn and um, how do we reduce the amount of money that's going going out the out the door, and that's tied to liquidity, but it's actually more of a, a business strategy. So where are we flying? Why? What types of things can we do on a voluntary basis? Are there any involuntary actions that uh, we should be considering? Notably, we haven't had any furloughs uh, as an airline, as a company to date, and we're very, very proud of that, but ensuring that the business is well informed on the implications for taking uh, any and all of those actions. Thank you, Brandon. A lot that I wanna to touch on and what you just shared. Um, but before we transition to that, for students or alums who are listening uh, this afternoon and are thinking about eventually wanting to be in a GC role, uh, to borrow that, that word that you used earlier, right? What intentional uh, steps can they take uh, either as a student and or as a recent grad to better prepare themselves eventually for uh, a role as a GC? I'll say, I'll, say, I'll take the first as a student. Uh, you have a tremendous opportunity to network people in my positions and other lawyers who are practicing, whether in-house or law firms, have a lot of interest and patience for meeting with students. So that's advice that I think many of us got when we were in school. And I think um, if you were there now, you should absolutely capitalize on that. There's nothing like a 2L or a 3L or even a 1L reaching out to someone. The odds of that person on the other end responding are significantly greater because you're a student. Um, that's just the reality. So I think you should leverage that. Um, beyond that to sort of more broadly, what are things that you can do is talk to as many people as you can in industries that may be of interest to you. Ask them what it is you know, they enjoy about their job or the challenges. So I think that networking piece, as you get into your career, the skill sets that you can build, um, I would think about business acumen. So whether you're a transactional lawyer or a litigator, a regulatory lawyer, employment lawyer, whatever you are, um, increasing your business acumen. So understanding some level of financial literacy. You, no one's going to ask you to prepare a financial statement, but you should at least be able to get your way through one and understand broadly what it's saying. So I think that financial literacy, business acumen is huge. Uh, I think the the EQ in a lot of these roles, um, really understanding and uh, how to read a room, um, take people's temperatures, it gives you a sense of, uh, of, of the risk tolerance of the room, what people's interests are, and a lot of times you can learn a lot more by listening and being the, uh, the one who's sort of absorbing information in a room as, to, as opposed to, uh, to speaking. And that's really difficult for us as lawyers because we, uh, we tend to, to be on, uh, on the speaking side. So I think that EQ, uh, and, I, and ultimately it, it all comes down to your judgment. So developing your judgment and evolving from a lawyer to a consigliere. And that's a lifelong journey. I'm certainly not there, but I think that should be sort of the end game that we all have in mind where you're, you're an advisor, you're a counselor, you're providing um, strategic direction and guidance based on your skills, experience, understanding what the interests of your client are. Um, so always focusing on how am I honing my judgment skills, how am I building it? How am I constantly tweaking it? 
um, that's kind of how I would look at being not just a GC, but being an effective lawyer in any capacity. Brandon, that's great. I'll ask one more question since it just came in and I'll maybe personalize it a bit for you. Let's say somebody is a partner at a firm and she or he is now thinking about transitioning and wants to move in house. I would love to hear about how you and your team thinks about recruiting into your teams. And if you're looking at someone with a lot more experience, um, any advice on tips that they can use to transition at that point? Sure. If it's me, reach out. Uh, reach out to me directly. Right. What we look for, people who are passionate about the industry, um, you know, the industry or JetBlue, the brand, having some connection because you, you have to be vested in this stuff. Um, the way I view talent historically and someone in our team yesterday, I was talking to someone on our team yesterday about this is I've always taken the approach of we will over index for passion, interest um, versus a specific skill set. So let's say we're looking, you know, and, and, but, and I'm the result of that. I mean, they were looking for a real estate lawyer. I'm always a real estate lawyer, but I love the company. I love the industry. I like airports. I love airplanes. Um, and so, I, you know, I've, continued that approach that my predecessor has had. So um, I wouldn't necessarily be, um, you know, constrained by a particular skill set that we're looking for now. So all of that means is reach out, develop the relationships. It's not just me, it's people on our team. And over time, to the extent something opens up, you will be at the fore. And I think you can take that advice to, you know, you can extrapolate beyond just me that if there is an industry or a company that you are interested in reaching out early and establishing those relationships and having a record of, uh, of demonstrated interest, I think is also important. Awesome. Let's switch topics a bit and talk about JetBlue. And I wanna start with JetBlue, the startup. Uh, and many may know this, right? It's, it's quite the inter interesting story. Uh, if any of you haven't heard the episode with Neil Amin on how I built this, I, I strongly encourage you to listen to that. Uh, quite an interesting story himself. Brandon, you may know this. It's a fun NYU law connection. Neil Amin looked up to Herb Kelleher. And as you probably know, Herb Kelleher himself went to NYU law. Um, so uh, small family and small world, even in the airline industry. But and one thing. Did, did you mention who Herb's? Did you mention where Herb was? Uh, yeah, uh, he founder and CEO of Southwest Airlines, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So uh, amazing story. But one thing that stood out to me, Brandon, that I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about was really the culture that Neil Amin set out to build. And certainly, as, as we all may know, he's gone on to do a bunch of other airline startups. Um, and he, he says uh, in the How I Built This episode, and I think this has been written about as well a few times, he says that pleasing the customer was more important than pleasing the CEO. And he gave the example about how in the early days he would fly, uh, get on the flight and he would actually sit in the last row in a seat that did not recline as a way to show and prove that point. Fast forward to today, how has that culture continued at JetBlue, New York City's hometown airline, by the way? Yeah, wow, well done. Well done. By the way, thank you for your business. You're clearly a, uh, a loyal JetBlue customer. We don't take that for granted. It's ingrained uh, throughout the organization. It's an organization that's built on, on culture. And so what do we mean by that? Back to this concept of being intentional. Uh, you know, we're intentional with our words. We, uh, we use the word customer. We don't use passenger. We use the word crew members. We don't use the word employee. We use the phrase business partners. We don't use um, vendors, uh, and we're and and that goes from you know from David when he started it through Dave Barger now through Robin, uh, and if you're in a meeting with Robin and you use one of those other words, he'll call you out on it. Um, and again, so you you have to be really focused. You have to be intentional. You have to be very disciplined about these things. What does it also mean? Orientation. Uh, David himself and Dave who followed him. Uh, for the first 10 years, you had the CEO attend every single orientation. This is every other week down in Orlando um, without fail to meet every single new crew member. Now, how do you scale that? It's difficult for Robin to do all of them. He probably does half, 
the the ones that he aren't the ones that he's unable to attend it's either joanna or one of us on the ceo team so a commitment uh to orientation using very intentional language we have a leadership a development uh program called principles of leadership which every leader must go through uh, and then once you're through it you then become a facilitator so i facilitate principles of leadership uh and you tell these you tell these stories it's uh it's a company that's built on on the values, safety, caring, integrity, passion, and fun. If you pulled any JetBlue, any one of us, 20,000 of us aside, they would rattle off the values for you, I, I can guarantee you, without hesitation, um, because we live this stuff, we practice it. And it's something that David talked about, Dave Barger built upon, and Robin certainly uh, continues to ingrain. It's how do you scale the culture, it's a lot easier to do when you have 40 planes and 6,000 crew members when I first started than when you have 265 planes, you're in 22 countries and you have 20,000 plus crew members. But you have to be diligent, you have to be intentional about it, uh, and you have to hold everyone accountable um, to that standard. And we certainly hold ourselves to that as a leadership team. That's great, Brandon, and it's, it's great to hear how that has continued as leadership has transitioned as well. Let's talk about today. Um, you know, you guys just, I think, recently uh, released your third quarter earnings and on the call it was shared, for instance, that your third quarter revenue has plunged by 76%. And even though that's a significant number, you're actually, from what I read, seem to be doing better than you expected. So. Um, curious to hear specifically how JetBlue is thinking about innovating and adjusting in such a time. Um, certainly, we're all waiting for a vaccine eventually, but um, you can't stop your business until that happens. And so, uh, would love to hear a few examples. I've certainly uh, heard and read about um, your commitment to keep the middle aisle open, I think now until December 1st. But if you could talk us through that and some other initiatives as well would be really interesting to hear. Sure, so let's start from the customer perspective. As you note, we had a middle seat commitment or we do have a middle seat commitment through December 1st. Um, and it's actually, it's, it's modified a bit. So what we've gone now is to a model of lidding or capping capacity. Um, so think that, you know, that's closer to 70% kind of between October 15th and, and December 1st. Um, and the reason that's modified, if you look at some of the studies that have come out, uh, there was a Harvard study, there's a Department of Defense study, there have been others that have demonstrated the sort of risk in flying and being aboard an aircraft relative to other activities. And what those studies have largely concluded is that the risk of being on uh, an aircraft uh, with mask on, with the way the filtration system, the air filters, um, the airflow in the cabin, uh, it's significantly lower than most other activities. So being in an office or being in a restaurant. Um, and so if you think about that, that helps inform how we how we approach this middle middle seat or lidded uh, issue. And so even if everyone's masked up, um, even without sort of middle seat protected, the the risk is significantly lower. And again, that's not just us saying it, we're certainly, we have an interest in saying that, but if you look at some of the objective studies that are out there uh, have demonstrated that. So we're hyper-focused on the science here and what are the risks and to the extent we can have a multi-layered approach in mitigating that risk. So masks, certainly, I think we were the first airline to, uh, to have that requirement. Uh, testing is something that, is at the fore now. So to your point, how do we bridge the gap between now and a vaccine uh, and or treatment? Testing is gonna be a big part of that. So how are we gonna innovate as a company and as an industry? I think you're gonna see a lot more around testing uh, going into the fourth quarter and certainly Q1 of 2021. I mean, you could imagine a, a rapid test, uh, you know, a future where there's a rapid test either uh, upon departure or arrival um, that's given to you know, most or all uh, customers and that's able to give you a sense. Again, it's not a panacea. We understand the challenges and the shortcomings of rapid, but it's part of this layered approach. That's the, you know, the air in the cabin, the mask, um, potentially lids, uh, all of that 
sort of stuff. So that's innovation on kind of the customer side. If you think about the pricing and the product, um, you know, some of our competitors have come out with this, you know, no more change fees ever. Um, which is a great PR and marketing stunt um, until they change their mind, of course, they can always. Um, but I think you're going to see innovations uh, in terms of flexibility on booking tickets, because if Anthony, you book um, for November the 10th and it turns out on November the 8th, you test positive, how are we going to you know, charge you a change fee as an industry? So I think uh, you'll see a lot of consumer friendly uh, changes in the pricing structure, not just of us, but of other airlines and the product. You know, I look at other models that are out there. JSX is one, it's a company based out of Texas. They fly out of FBOs or kind of private terminals um, where they aren't as crowded. The, the seating on board is more spaced out. You wonder if there's uh, gonna be a surge in demand for that type of onboard product. Uh, you're going to see a lot more contactless. I think you see that certainly with us boarding, um, also on board with the service, less frequent service, service that's done in a more thoughtful way. So I think you're going to, again, all of this goes to what I would call or what we call sort of a layered approach to safety, understanding that not any one of those is going to be uh, completely foolproof. Thanks, Brandon. Let's switch topics a bit here. And I want to talk a bit about tech ventures. Tell us a bit more about JetBlue Tech Ventures. Why did the airline launch this initiative? And give us a sense of the investment thesis as well. Sure. Uh, love Tech Ventures. We launched it. I was a big part of that back in two, late 2016, I think, going into 17. Um, a few observations. We we have a board, so this is very much done with the board's support and encouragement. Uh, and we have a board that, you know, at that time said, look, there's a lot of disruption in a lot of industries. I mean, aviation and the airline business is certainly ripe for that. I mean, our model, when you think about the way that we uh, either structure networks or price products or onboard service and uh, the way we sort of um, supply uh, labor, whether it's pilots or in-flight uh, technicians, none of that has changed in a really long time. So um, why don't we set up a captive VC and that it, that's initially charged with being uh, an intelligence source and find out what's going on, uh, not just in airlines and aviation specifically, but across the travel ribbon. Um, so that was the, the, the first, the sort of the first part of setting it up is really being a kind of in-house um, R&D or um, innovation sort of, I don't wanna call it an innovation center or lab, but being our eyes and ears in terms of what's going on out there. Uh, the other thing is we wanted to be in Silicon Valley because that's, you know, there are certainly tech hubs all around the country and, and the world, but we really wanted to be where sort of there was a critical mass. So that was an intentional decision. So we actually opened up an office and San Carlos. The investment thesis, it's around the travel ribbon broadly. So think uh, anything from Joby, which is uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles um, to a revenue management sort of optimization product uh, in Flyer, which was our first uh, investment and everything in between. So it's the broadly the travel ribbon or travel ecosystem as we like to, to refer to it early stage. So we're not out there competing with, you know, the professional VCs that are doing this for very uh, predetermined or specified return rates. Um, certainly there's a financial component because we don't like to think of them as competing, but rather complementary. but we're not in that, uh, you know, we're not in that same business in terms of scale. So early stage travel uh, ribbon, um, we have a team in place out there so I would say, you know, 75% of it does that. There's also an operational team that then plays back into the organization, these sprints. So we'll have innovation sprints. So we went through it as a legal team. Our customer support team went through it. And that's really just to, to challenge the thinking and to show the operational teams internally kind of what's out there. So th that's, that's kind of broadly how it's structured. Um, so maybe I'll pause there because I'm sure you have specific questions. Definitely, that's, that's great. Uh, you mentioned too, uh, and you could 
go a bit deeper on the two that you gave examples for or another one. Can you tell us a bit more about a company that you've invested in and that you're particularly excited about? Would love to hear a bit more about what, you know, what vertical specifically they're in, what problem they're looking to solve, et cetera. You know, I, Joby, uh, which we've gone public and they've come out of stealth mode maybe about six or 12 months ago. Um, if you think about a medium haul, call it travel market. So whether it's call it 40 to 100 miles, let's say maybe maybe a bit longer. Um, if, if you think about that, our view is that's and call it, I think about 100 to 150 is maybe the right kind of range to think about. You know, our view is within that, within that sort of space and mileage uh, range, you're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of innovation. So it's maybe too short historically for short hop flights, um, but maybe it's too long for a traditional bus ride or something to that effect. So in comes uh, Joby. So think Uber, longer range. It's uh, aerial, so you know it's again, it's a, a it's a it's electric. It's a it's a vehicle that takes off sort of vertically, um, which is important in getting in and out of sort of tight spaces on top of city buildings. So if you have a congested kind of downtown uh, area, it, it's a manned. It's notably that there is a it's piloted, so it's not uh, this isn't something that someone's controlling from a remote control far away. Uh, we thought that was important and it carries, you know, up to five or six uh, passengers as they, you know, as they call them customers as we would. So uh, thinking about it from an environmental footprint, the electric standpoint, uh, congestion and, you know, a, a distances that are probably a bit longer than makes sense to drive and too short to fly. So that's uh, kind of how we're thinking about it. I mean, their thinking is much more developed and nuanced than that. But that's, as we see it, a part of the travel ribbon and ecosystem that is, you know, up for to, uh, up for some disruption and innovation. Um, so that's one we're particularly uh, particularly excited about. I mentioned Flyer because it was our first investment, and um, you know what they have caused us to do is really think about how we revenue manage, how do how do we price flights and. I know it's much frustration of the of the traveling public that you could be sitting on a plane. Anthony, you and I are both going to Pittsburgh. I paid 79 bucks and you paid 379 bucks. How did that happen? Um, so bringing uh, more clarity and optimization to that. So rather than me, you know, you paying 379 and me paying 79, maybe both of us should be, you know, paying 205 or something like that. Split the difference. Um, so thinking about really that space, because it's very, it's manually done now, it's labor intensive. Um, it doesn't move in a dynamic way. And so it's really helping us sort of think about the next generation uh, of revenue management. So those are two that we're particularly excited about. Thanks, Brandon. I'm curious to hear since the start of the pandemic, uh, either have you uh, invested in or seen companies that you can talk about um, that are solving an interesting problem, or if you can't talk about that in detail, what areas have emerged in your view that are ripe for innovation and disruption? Uh, testing, for sure. This concept of, uh, of, ma of testing on a ma mass scale, whether it's rapid testing or PCR testing, um, so, so testing, absolutely. Um, you know, our approach during, during sort of the, the pandemic was to sort of to hunker down. Uh, we want to ensure that the market knows that we're still uh, very much alive and viable, but we also have to be sort of a good corporate citizen given the, the cash burn metrics and the downturn revenue that you noted that we discussed on the earnings call yesterday. Um, so we're remaining active and again in this in this area of being an innovation lab and seeing what's what's out there and mapping that back to what the company is focused on and what's important to us and and nothing can be more critical as providing a bridge to the vaccine than testing. So we've looked at uh, a lot of uh, concepts, innovations uh, in the testing realm and specifically kind of 
scalability of that. So how do you test on a <clears throat> on a mass scale? Um, so we've been very very active there, uh, which has been great for the company. Awesome, Brendan. If somebody's on this call and would like to get an intro into JetBlue Tech Ventures, uh, how would they do so? Send me an email. Awesome. <laughs> you can send me an email. We Thank also you. have a, they have tech ventures. If you go on their website, they have an uh, intake uh, form and an intake email. I mean, we source deals from everywhere directly, directly through that, through the network that we've created, um, through some of the innovation labs that you're surely familiar with. Um, but most directly reach out to us. If you're, if you're hitting a wall, please, uh, please shoot me a note and I'll make sure that we get it in front of the right team. Great. Brennan, a question came in here uh, and I wanted to ask you this. What is the biggest learning that you will take away from your work navigating the pandemic? The biggest learning is to not panic. Um, at the very depth of this, uh, given our industry, I mean, you're seeing a reduction of 95% demand. I mean, essentially no one was flying. There was effectively a run on the bank in terms of customer refunds. Uh, it you know, wasn't clear as to what level of support we would get from Congress, if any. Uh, and, you know, it was the business, the business was in pretty dire, dire straits. Um, but if we were to have panicked as a leadership team, our team would have felt that, um, the public would have felt that. Um, we certainly sort of do uh, disaster scenario planning, if you will. And so that's not to say don't have a plan um, if things were to, to have gotten even worse, but I think uh, you have to project some level of stability and calmness into the team and the organization uh, otherwise, people people will really um, sort of give up hope, and then that's how you lose the organization. I think it's also important to note, um, and I think you mentioned this at the top, with a lot of the um, the discourse we were seeing as a result of George Floyd's murder this summer, uh, and a lot of the things that's come out of that. Uh, I mean, it would be remiss of me not to mention the impact that that had on us as a team and as a company, um, certainly me personally, uh, and so reacting to that as well. And I would take that same approach, which is um, you have to channel that energy uh, into something that's, that's positive and productive uh, for the company and for society at large. And how do you advance, you know, how do you use that as a springboard to advance um, interests that I think that are near and dear to many of us. So I, my overall, it's a long winded way of saying, don't panic. And out of every crisis comes an opportunity. And we really have to remember that. Um, and especially in innovation and technology, and it just frees people's minds up for creative thinking and organizations, people, individuals, everyone is far more receptive in these times of crisis. And so I really challenge people to think long and hard about how do you uh, leverage and capitalize on, on the opportunity. Thanks, Brandon. And I, I have to say on a personal note, I've seen you demonstrate that on, on both accounts, both your ability to stay calm in the midst of an incredibly chaotic time for your industry and in the world. And I know you and I've chatted even post um, George Floyd's murder and um, and all of, uh, all, all of the many things that have happened since then and to see you navigate and lead through that as well has been inspiring for me. So thank you. Thank uh, you, I appreciate a, that. A different topic here, but uh, I think an incredibly important one and um, I wanna touch on that. Uh, the question is, has uh, Tech Ventures made any investments in environmental or sustainability areas to improve the air travel industry's environmental impact? We've done we've done a few sprints and we've looked deeply at some companies where we're focused on as an organization and Tech Ventures certainly helped us get there is on sustainable aviation fuel and there are so there are a lot of companies out there uh, you know some of the challenges they're having are on the regulatory side are the incentives there uh, and is the capacity there so the refining capacity so technology absolutely exists how do you make it scale 
and how are the public policies and regulations um, structured in a way to sort of incentivize that. Um, so we've done a lot of, so Tech Ventures has brought a lot of that learning to the organization. Um, in terms of actual investments, um, you know, TBD in this space as we're watching it evolve. Great, Brandon, we'll end with this final question. Uh, there are so many words that we can probably use to describe 2020. <laughs> and since this is an NYU law event, I'll try to refrain from using some of them. <laughs> uh, but one, one thing's for sure, it's been an incredibly uncertain year. In less than a week, we have an election in our country. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around so many different industries. Uh, our 1L students will be interviewing for summer roles. Uh, in January, uh, that was moved from summer to January, given everything that was happening. What advice would you have for a student and or an alum who may find uh, herself or himself laid off um, in this current time? Any suggestions given that you've had to navigate that in the past personally? I would say double down on what you're passionate about. Uh, focus your energy. It's a great opportunity um, to really get a sense of where you want to go and where you want to take your career uh, and map out a, a plan and a strategy on how to get there. So it's, uh, it's a difficult time. I know it personally. Uh, I recall, you know, being on unemployment. Um, you know, I'm not at all ashamed to say that. So, I, and I only mention that um, to, to understand that I, I get the depth of it, but it really is, it's an opportunity. And it's an opportunity to either redefine yourself or to focus on kind of where your your passion really lies and an opportunity to to go after it and think about you know the world as it's evolving and where are things going. I mean, there's so much passion and energy around ESG, um, technology, um, all of these things, and how can we um, you know use our, our our platforms or how can organizations better address the, the, the problems and the challenges that we're having in society and how and where do you want to plug into that? Uh, and if you can align with a, a company or an organization or an institution's mission in a way that brings you professional and personal fulfillment, then you should map out a strategy and a plan for how to get from where you are now to there. Brandon, that's awesome. A huge thanks to you for your time today. This has been inspiring, encouraging, uplifting, much needed in times like this. And um, it's such a pleasure to be able to talk with you today and also to hear more about your story and your journey, as well as um, what's happening at JetBlue and at Tech Ventures. So thank you. A big thanks to all who have attended as well. I want to give a quick uh, plug to one more event that we have this fall semester, which will be happening on Tuesday, November the 10th at 5 p.m. We'll have Vinay Jain, who is at Amex, and David Pashman, who is GC at JW Player, talking specifically about uh, transitioning from a traditional legal practice into a tech company. So if you're interested in that, please feel free to register. That's Tuesday, November the 10th at 5 o'clock. And again, Brandon, a huge thanks to you. Um, it's really been great to be able to chat with you this afternoon. Thank you so much. Anthony, thank you. And I love everything you're doing. So uh, my thanks to you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks all. Yeah. Have a great afternoon and stay safe. Bye-bye. Take care.